Okay, let's kick off, guys. Uh, probably some people will join during the session, but it's fine. We can still let them in uh, during. Um, so yeah, thank you all for joining uh, this, this session, this webinar, because uh, we're uh, used to having uh, meetups, uh, physical meetups with Computer Futures. We did a couple of webinars before the summer, and now we're, we started last week with a data webinar. Uh, this week, Peter Noyes will elaborate on IBS Fargate and cloud native development. Um, I'll, I'll don't, don't, keep, don't keep you guys too long. Uh, you probably know Computer Futures. I'm uh, Christoph. I've or co organized this with Peter. Uh, I'm responsible for everything concerning Java and data driven software development within Computer Futures. So if any questions about that, please reach out to me. Uh, Peter will take you through the, this journey um, just for the a quick uh, house rules. Uh, so you can ask questions during the webinar. Please post them in the comment section on your right hand side. There will be time for a quick uh, uh, Q&A of about 15, 20 minutes after the session. So if very uh, long questions and you really want to know uh, extra stuff from Peter, you can ask them at that time. Uh, we're planning to round off at 12.30, 12.40, so we won't keep you much longer than an hour. And I'll give the floor to, uh, to Peter. Thank you, Christoph. Well, I think uh, then I will just go ahead. Um, let me share my screen for the presentation. Do you all see uh, the presentation right now? I'll yes. assume that that's the yes. case. Yes. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, good morning in these Corona times. <laughs> I hope you're all uh, safe and doing well um, at home or maybe still at the office, I don't know. Um, I will first um, do a really short introduction about myself. Um, as you can see here on the slide, you see Piotr, but that's not actually my uh, my real name. Um, I'm uh, Peter Noyens, and I'm a full stack developer. Um, um, I like I started my career in like 2016, um, working for Accenture, and from that time onwards, I have been working um, in the fields mainly uh, in blockchain technology. In the beginning, um, I'm still doing that, but I'm also um, well doing more general software development uh, on the side uh, next to that. So um, when I started in 2016 and, and where I am right now in terms of like my daily practices and, and how I, um, how I um, build my code and how I bring it um, to production, uh, it's completely different right now. So um, that's a bit what it, this presentation is about how it evolved uh, over time and um, what my current uh, practices are. Um, and I don't know actually what, um, or if uh, most of you are technical people or maybe on the business side, but I guess it, um, it would be useful for uh, both of these roles. Um, let me see if I can skip to the next slide. Uh, the airborne developer, um, it's a bit of a word, um, how do you say it worth feeling? Um, because nowadays everything is uh, is going towards the cloud. Um, like I said in the beginning, I was also working in the cloud, but it was just um, manually launching my virtual machines and uh, yeah, provisioning the servers, installing um, yeah, all the software that was needed. And that took like a lot of time. Um, probably some of you also know that, uh, that history and I, yeah, I don't know how much of you are already um, transition, transitioning to a more um, fluid um, way of uh, working in that sense. Um, but if not, then this could maybe uh, help you in your own day-to-day -day activities. So let's start off. I um, searched uh, for a few memes. Um, I think maybe some of you already uh, know these memes. Um, basically, I will just show them and Later on, it will be clear what they, um, well, what they mean and what, yeah, why I use them. Um, this is also a pretty popular one. And the next one. So basically, if you are a developer and you work for a big firm, then oftentimes you hear a lot of buzzwords and everyone is talking about these, um, these hyped words like cloud native development, I, I use it myself right now. Um, but most of the people don't have a, a real grasp on what it really is. Um, so let's try to explain it a bit uh, more in detail. 
So what I also looked up is like, how are the bigger companies um, in tech defining what cloud native really is? Um, according to IBM, cloud native development is about how an application is built and deployed and not where it resides. Um, and if development is cloud native, developers can build a more nice new digital and AI cloud services and utilize a scalable and automated approach for consistent management and orchestration. Um, as you see, I marked the word automated and in the next uh, definitions, I also marked some words um, that will um, be useful for later uh, to give a more clear overview of what cloud native development is. Then this is the definition according to Red Hat. I will just let you um, read it. Um, I guess I can go on to the next one. Um, CNCF is the cloud native computing foundation. So they actually have a GitHub page um, in which they describe or define cloud native in multiple languages. Um, I think that's also because of um, bringing a bit more clarity in, in, in what this, this buzzword actually is. But as you can see, also in this definition, you see uh, the marked words and they pretty much come back to the same uh, elements every time. So let's do a small recap of these uh, marked words and definitions. Um, I brought them down to these four terms or um, concepts. First one, DevOps and CI CD. Second one, microservices. Third one, containers. And the fourth one, serverless, um, serverless computing or immutable infrastructure. Um, and let's talk a bit more about these four uh, concepts. So DevOps, I got this quote from uh, a friend of mine who might be joining this uh, webinar, but I'm not sure if he's in now. Um, it says DevOps is a culture, not a role. The whole company needs to be doing DevOps for it to work. And that's actually true um, because some, well, oftentimes CI CD, which is also a really um, popular term is uh, confused with DevOps, but really CI CD is like, a, uh, yeah, uh, an implementation or part of an implementation of um, the philosophy of DevOps, the, the culture DevOps has to, has to bring uh, within the, the organization. So CI CD, I found this picture from um, the website of GitLab, which is also software that I use um, to, uh, to implement all these uh, techniques in my, uh, in my daily activities. Uh, so basically the CI pipeline you see here is uh, the build, test and integration phase. Um, so that you can see before you want to deploy it, if everything is fine, if everything's working as planned. Um, and then if that's all checked, you can go on to the next phase, which is the CD phase, uh, the continuous deployment or continuous uh, delivery phase in which you can actually bring the application live in, uh, in multiple environments. So you don't want to start uh, with a new feature and directly go to uh, production. Well. It still happens a lot, I guess, but uh, it's not the best um, the best approach. So normally you would just release a feature for uh, a select group of people and then they um, will give continuous reviews and feedback. So you can iterate um, very fast and be sure that everything is working fine and is accepted by the users before you go um, into production. So that's, of course, also um, goes together with uh, the Scrum methodology and Agile way of working, um, but I will also come back to that later on. Then this is a picture about DevOps, uh, the concept or the philosophy, which is, as you can see, a bit broader than just the continuous integration and continuous delivery. Um, it also includes, the, well, as I said, the, the, the concept or the, uh, the philosophy in the organization that you really put focus to what your um, user really wants and how they uh, react to certain changes in, um, in the application. And around the, um, the symbol, you see lots of uh, technologies, lots of solutions that are um, hard to, uh, to skip if you want to, um, to implement DevOps well in your organization. So some of these I also use in my practices, but um, not all of them, of course. I will later on explain which ones I really uh, use in my, in my activities. 
Um, if there is any question so far, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll just go on to the next concept. Microservices, also another um, hype term. <laughs> um, but what is it actually? Um, microservices, they, they always compare it to the monolithic uh, applications um, that, are, that were used uh, before and, and are still used by a lot of organizations. Um, difference is that microservices are smaller parts of the application that can be built in theory um, independently. So that's also why I highlighted the loosely coupled term here. So that's one of the main uh, aspects of it, that they can be developed independently. Um, and also the, the last point, the Spotify model, I will go over it in the next slide. Um, it enables teams to, um, to parallelize, basically. So um, it's easier for multiple teams within one organization to, um, to work efficiently on every service um, and then integrate it all together if they have good um, agreements on what the interfaces, interfaces uh, should be. Uh, another big advantage is that for every microservice you build, um, for example, you have a payment service um, and um, an account service where you store user accounts and stuff like that. For every service, every functionality in this application, you can then choose the most optimal database, for example, or the most optimal coding language. It actually doesn't matter that much um, what every team is using. They, can, they should be able to decide that for themselves because they are working on that uh, feature or um, element of the application. So they probably know the best what's, um, what's most appropriate. Um, and basically, the, the reason why it works is because of the integrations, uh, the inter-service communications are normalized or are standardized. Um, so they, they just want to know what you have to put in the service and what it's coming out. And there's, of course, different ways how you can um, communicate uh, between the services. Um, but as long as these agreements are made, then these teams can work pretty independently, which um, causes for um, more motivated employees, more motivated developers. Um, they have more responsibility or feeling of responsibility for the, the stuff they deliver. Um, and also, also one of the, the, the big, big uh, advantages of this is that if something should be changed or um, if a part of the, the application needs to be, um, be better or uh, include new features, you can just replace this microservice with uh, a newer one. Um, instead of waiting for the complete application to be uh, going to a next version. So it's, um, it's more modular. Um, another important aspect is that um, scalability is, is much well more fine-grained. So imagine you have a really big monolithic application and um, suddenly there is like more traffic happening to that uh, service or application. That you need to, um, well, you can vertical, vertically increase the, the capacity of the server where it's running on, or you can put another uh, server next to it uh, with the same monolithic application. But you always you have to replicate this whole um, big um, monolith of application to a new uh, to a new server. So it's not you cannot um, in a detailed way scale what um, more res resources you need. Um, in the case of microservices, if you notice that one of the microservices is being used uh, more than the other ones, then you just um, scale that service, um, which is more efficient in terms of resource usage and also uh, the costs that are uh, going with that. One of the, um, the standards that are um, thought of in terms of microservices is that they should be um, built or replaced in a matter of weeks and not in months or years so that the iteration cycle can be uh, much, uh, much faster. And um, in the end, that also couples back to the DevOps uh, mentality and iterating uh, quickly to improve the product. So this is a picture that um, I found for the, um, for the Spotify model. Um, I'm not going too deep into this, but it um, resembles the fact that within Spotify, they work in a microservices model um, in which the teams are independently working on, on their own um, feature or responsibility. 
um, and they manage to to create a model in which um, they facilitate the um, also inter-team communication so they can talk with each other what they are working on and learn from each other um, but effectively parallelize the work uh, the work so that um, yeah they're not blocking anyone so that's um, that's a bit what this picture is about if you're interested then you can also always uh, look up more information about it um, containers also an aspect that's hard to um, to skip if you want to to work in a cloud native way. Um, when I say containers, it says, uh, well, it's, 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 it's noted here, that's um, most of the times, if not always, uh, about Docker containers. Um, Docker containers are really uh, small images of um, part of an uh, application, in, in the case of microservices, that contain all of the dependencies and all of the, well, the, the, the exact environment that this part of the application needs in order to run. So it, um, it enables it to be really portable and um, you can easy build, launch, duplicate and terminate these containers if you want to scale your application or uh, bring a new feature to life. So it's, as you can see, it's all uh, really correlated a lot, but these four things um, or three things that I discussed until now are um, pretty important elements. Then serverless computing, um, if you look for cloud native development, it's most of the times you don't see this, uh, this word um, correlate. Well, it's, it's correlated, but they don't always say that it's um, a core aspect to it. But um, in one of the definitions, you also saw the, um, the immutable infrastructure part. Um, so when I, when I started uh, as a developer, I had to provision my own servers and stuff like that. Um, but with this serverless computing, you can go really far um, to skip that part and to outsource the management and the maintenance of uh, servers to your cloud provider. Um, of course, this has quite some advantages, but also um, there also are some disadvantages to it. Um, most of the organizations today are not ready uh, yet to like replace the complete application with, um, for example, functions, as they call it. Um, functions which are used in AWS Lambda or Google Cloud functions. Um, but the fact is the same as with microservices that if you want to transition from a legacy application or a monolithic application, you can gradually do that. So you can start with creating a microservice for part of the application and, and over time um, build a strategy to go to a more um, cloud native solution. So. The same goes for um, these uh, functions. Um, they are also sometimes criticized for the latency. Um, if you have a part of the application that's not used all of the time, um, but certainly important, then it can be that um, the, the cloud provider or the infrastructure needs some time to warm up uh, this function or the infrastructure um, behind it. So, um, Yes, it takes away a lot of the, the worries about um, management and maintenance of the, the infrastructure, but it can also um, if, um, result in some unexpected things. So what you don't need to forget is that behind all of this uh, magic, as you might uh, see it, there is still um, hardware involved and servers involved and you cannot get around that. So here is another meme that <laughs> serverless is made of servers. So the term is a bit, bit misleading. Um, when I read it the first time, I was also like, what, what do they actually mean with it? Um, and it appears to be also for the cloud providers that it's not always um, um, a really narrow term. So as the title of this presentation refers to AWS Fargate, I wouldn't say it's a real um, serverless technology according to the, the previous slide. Um, it's more, as it says here, a serverless container platform um, to take away the, the maintenance worries if you want to uh, work with Docker containers and um, work in clusters. Um, so a cluster, I think most of you know Kubernetes, uh, which is uh, the most popular also open source um, cluster uh, platform to easily uh, scale your Docker containers and make them all work together. 
in this case, um, I've also worked with Kubernetes in the past just to, uh, to try it out a bit. But for me, it was still quite some overhead to, um, to, to, to set it up. Um, in my case, it's not always needed to, um, to use that. Um, what I do use and what I will also show in this, uh, in this presentation is the Elastic Container Service provided by AWS. Um, which basically does um, a bit of the same thing, but more as a managed service. They also have managed Kubernetes, but that's uh, out of scope of this presentation. Um, AWS Fargate um, also has native support for uh, autoscaling. So when you set it up, you can easily define when a service, service need to, needs to, um, to scale up or scale down um, according to, uh, to a parameter that you can define which is basically the CPU usage, memory usage, or the traffic volume that goes into that part of the application. Uh, so basically you indicate a, a percentage of that resource. And if it goes above that, then it will just um, instantiate a new container and um, direct traffic that's incoming to, um, to the new container. So they split up the traffic uh, via load balancers. Then it's time for some hands-on work. Uh, let me quickly check the time. How long are we already running? Or how much time do I still have, uh, Crystal? Yeah, you still have some time. You still have like 15 minutes, but it's five, okay. five before 12, so. All right. Um, okay, well, it's a good thing then that I already did uh, most of the work before. So um, here's a bit of an overview of the stack that I use. Um, and, but this is only on the backend side, of course. Um, the things that I marked here are the, the things that I want to show in this presentation. Uh, the other ones are a bit uh, out of scope, um, but they are being used in this, uh, in this example. Um, yeah, maybe I can quickly go over them. Inero Proget is my uh, artifactory, uh, so to, uh, to speak, to fetch my dependencies on the application side. So I have my own libraries. Um, in Java that I use um, when I when I start a project and I store them there. Um, Docker, of course, to, to make the uh, portable image. Uh, GitLab is my version uh, control system to keep track of all the changes, which also has a built-in uh, CI tool, GitLab CI, which I use to um, do my, um, well, my CI CD pipelines and connect it to AWS. AWS Fargate, I already discussed. ECS also uh, discussed. ECR is the Elastic Container Registry. So maybe some of you know the Docker Hub, um, which is a service by Docker, um, but ECR is a service by Amazon, which does the same thing. You can there store your Docker images and always well, fetch them to, um, to launch the image in a new, um, well, on a new uh, server or anything like that. So you use it to fetch the Docker image. Um, VPC is the virtual private clouds, which um, enables to have a completely isolated environment. Um, like I will show you, I have a development environment and a staging environment, uh, environment, and they are completely separated. So if you would also have a production environment, then in this way, you can make sure that the data, for example, the users is always um, separated from uh, the other environments. SQS is the simple queuing service, which I also use, but not in this uh, application. I thought I would um, use it, but in the end I didn't, um, which is a, um, well, a message queue to, um, to enable communication also between the, between the services. RDS is the relational database service, first service, which is a pretty important one, um, which contains all the data basically on Postgres uh, database. ELB is the load balancer, um, S3 is the file storage, um, but it's also not really used in this example. Uh, okay, so I will now switch my screen to um, my browser. Let me see. Can you all see my uh, browser right now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So what I did for this presentation is I made a new um, demo application in Java, um, as you can see here. This is stored on my own GitLab instance, uh, which is running on DigitalOcean. Of course, you can also use the, the public or um, 
and the, the, the hosting services of GitLab to make your own private project. Um, but in this case, I have my own instance. Um, so here you can see the code of this, uh, of this project. In this POM file, um, basically I describe um, how the, the project layout is. Um, so as you can see here, it's a CFR gate demo, location uh, with the description. And then here you can see that I fetched uh, the dependencies that I need to, uh, to, uh, to have the features enabled in the application. Um, here are the, well, I, I have three branches here and I will mainly focus on the development branch, um, which has the, the CI CD pipeline coupled to it. So every branch has its own pipeline, um, has its own connections to AWS, um, and it's also its own environment on AWS, um, which I will show. So I already did a first uh, deployment. As you can see here, it all went well. Um, test, build, deploy, these are the three phases in the, in the pipeline. Um, and these are defined in the GitLab YAML file, which is, uh, is here. Um, but yeah, I, if you want, I can also, if, if someone is interested, I can share this code with you. Um, I also made um, a short manual or a walkthrough to, um, to do the same things basically that I did if you want to, um, well, to check it out for yourself. Um, yeah, but I guess that you, you can uh, communicate that to Christoph or um, I don't remember the name <laughs> um, if you want to, um, to have that. Um, so what's also important if you want to do this, um, you need some other uh, configuration, configuration like environment variables, and that's also um, linked to the different environments. These are stored here, um, as you can see. I will not go over them individually because it will be a bit um, much, but I did that all um, in front, um, up front. So then let's go to the AWS Management Console. I'm now logged into my uh, account. Um, and I will still quickly see, Christoph, um, at what hour do you want me to finish the presentation? What time? To finish somewhere between 10 and 15 after 12, it's fine. Then we okay. still 10, 10, 15 minutes for the Q&A. OK. OK, then um, first I will, I will quickly show you the application um, itself. Um, do you still see my browser now? Yeah. Yeah. OK, I will switch to my IDE. I think you will now see the IntelliJ, right? Yeah. OK, so this file here is um, like it in initializes the context of the application. Um, as you can see here, I store a user uh, in the database. And you can see the plain text password, which of course you would never uh, do um, in real life. But this is just to show you um, well, for the demo purposes. Um, so I store a user with, an, with my name um, and with a password. And then I also have a controller here which um, opens up an endpoint that I can use um, to get um, a greeting message from the application. So this is the, as you can see here, the development branch of the, um, of the application. And this is already deployed on AWS Parkland. What I also did is um, I put it in a domain name. <laughs> I, I used the domain name uh, cfrgatedemo.com. And there I can um, first call the login endpoint to get my token for authentication. Um, I'll do that quickly again. And then you can see here the authorization bearer and then a, a big string, which is the token. And I can use that to, um, to call the endpoint API slash hello. And if I do that, I will get back a message saying hello there, Peter. So it uses my first name um, to greet me basically. Um, what I will do now, and I will do it now because it still takes five minutes or so to, um, to bring the new application live. But I will change a part of the code here. So here you see, hello there, user get first name. And I will change that um, to indicate that the, uh, the application has indeed changed. So I'll, we'll say greetings user.get first name. 
will make it a bit longer. I will also use my last name and I will do a comma and also display my display name and perhaps also a dot in the end. So this is a code change um, that I will bring live now. So I will push it to the GitLab server and then the pipelines will be triggered and the application will be deployed on um, the Elastic Container Service of AWS. Um, yeah, so let's do that. I will do a new commit. I will say changed small part of the code. And as you can see, it will be uh, committed to the development branch, which is also what I want. And then I will push it to the GitLab server. Push successful. Um, we can check that again. If I go to the GitLab again um, and I go to the development branch, you can see here change small part of the code, and you will see also that the pipeline is running. Excuse me, you're still seeing the IntelliJ. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, my, my bad. Can you see it here? Yes, we see it now. Yeah. So you see that the test phase has begun. Uh, you can also follow it up. Um, so it will be live streamed, uh, the console logs to see if everything uh, goes well. But we'll just um, let that run in the background uh, because it takes a bit of time. Um, so I will just, because of the time, I don't have that much time anymore. Um, I will quickly go to the ECR uh, to start with, the Elastic Container Registry. And as you can see here, I also have the repository name here um, corresponding to the project name. And you see a lot of tags here. Um, basically, they all fall, uh, fall in the same entry because the image itself, it's not changed. It's the same hash. So the system knows that it's all the same uh, Docker image. Um, but this is coming from the staging branch. This is coming from the master branch. And then you also have some uh, commit hashes from GitLab, which are also used as tags for an image. Um, you can see that these are coming from different commits. But that means that the code itself of the application, so the, the Java code itself, did not change during these commits. It was uh, like the, the stuff around it, the GitLab YAML file, for example. Um, but if they do, if the code changes, you will see another um, entry here, which like the nice thing is that it keeps all of your images that you build. It also yeah, takes some space, like this one is 117 megabytes but it will enable you to quickly, if you want to roll back, you can always indicate that you want to go back to this git uh, commit hash and you will immediately have the image ready. You don't have to do the complete build cycle again, uh, which saves some time, especially if you are in a production bug um, and you want to immediately go back, then this is a, well, this is a way to do it. Um, then, I will go to the main part. The most important part is, of course, the Elastic Container Service. Um, so this is a bit similar to the Kubernetes um, platform. Here I um, can make my clusters. So for the development and staging environments, I have separate clusters, which have also completely separate uh, VPCs, as you remember, the virtual private clouds. Um, so let's go to the development cluster. And as you can see, I also have a service here, which has basically the same name, CFR gate demo development. And this service is the, the part of the cluster that um, is hosting the, well, this part of the application, or in this case, it's just one, it's one service. So that's this one. And when you define the service, um, you indicate, for example, how the auth scaling should work and stuff like that. Um, I will not do it completely again, but I will show you how, um, how it is done. Um, the task definition is also uh, important. Here you define um, which Docker container you want to use and also which um, environment variables that are needed to spin it up correctly. So if I go to this uh, task definition, you also see a history of the changes that are that have been made. Um, if I go to the latest one, you can see here that, um, that it's compatible with Fargate, um, also a name. 
you cannot directly change attributes here, then you need to create a new revision. So let's do that. Um, the, I will just um, show you the most important parts. If you really want to dive deeper, then um, well, I, I will um, forward you the manual in which all the steps are described. Um, here you can indicate the, the memory and CPU usage that this service um, or this task definition needs. So if you have, in this case, I have a Java application, I know that it uses um, quite a bit of memory. So I um, give it two gigabytes. It's probably still a bit too much, but um, just make sure that it doesn't crash or um, while it's, uh, it's launching. Um, if you do this, then well, you don't have to indicate it separately for the Docker container itself. As you can see here, I have um, the Docker container definition, and I will quickly open that. Here I can indicate the, the image location, and this is the um, this is referring to the, the container registry of the AWS. So you can um, copy there the URI of the image, and you just paste it here. Um, and by the way, this um, this step of filling these uh, details in, you only have to do once, um, and after that the CI, CD pipeline, in this case, takes all of the, uh, the stuff and, and, well, it makes a new revision, but it will use it and you don't have to do it manually. Um, port mapping, it's also important to, um, to forward the ports uh, and make it uh, accessible. And then the other, of course, uh, important part are the environment variables in which you can, for example, store the um, AWS uh, secrets and, and stuff like that so that the Docker container can use the services that it uh, needs. And that's pretty much all of the important stuff. So when you have defined that, you can create a task definition. Um, and I also indicate that task definition in my CI CD configuration variables. Um, then I will go back to the service. So first you need to make that task definition and then you can make um, your service. If you're making a service, you, of course, indicate your task definition. That's the first step. You also indicate the revision. Um, this is um, also some general, general information, um, pretty straightforward. Then here you can indicate the number of tasks that you want to um, have running. Um, and you can indicate a minimum healthy percent and maximum percent. So at, at all times, it will make sure that there is one uh, container running uh, and maximum, um, well, if, if it's rolling to a new um, deployment, then there will be maximum two uh, containers running at the same time. This is, um, well, here you can indicate the load balancer, but I will skip that for now. Um, this is, uh, well, the, the most interesting part also um, for the auto scaling. So here I indicate how the auto scaling should work. And if it scales up, then you can also indicate how much um, tasks it can create. Um, well, you put a limit on that and also a desired number of tasks. Um, then the scaling policy here, you can indicate what I said in the slides. Uh, you can choose between CPU utilization, memory utilization, and request count, count per target to indicate um, what threshold you want to use in order to, uh, to scale it up or down. And that's basically the most important part. So I will, I will skip uh, the rest for now. But as I said earlier, you can find it all in the in the walkthrough. Um, then I will quickly go back to the CI/CD cycle and see how far it is. So I see here the three uh, check marks. So it should mean that everything went well and it should be live. So normally it has had enough time to, um, to bring it live and to spin up the containers. You can also check that here, uh, but we will just uh, try it out in, the, well, in my um, HTTP client here, it's Postman. Um, and I will try again to uh, call this endpoint and see what it gives. And as you see, you see greetings, Peter Noyens, the airborne developer, which is the new part of the code. And- Excuse me, we, we are still on- the, Oh, on the <laughs> sorry. Sorry, um, let me share. Yeah, so now the surprise is a bit, uh, <laughs> it's a bit gone, but if I call it, you can see here, 
Greetings Bitcoin OS, the airborne developer, which resembles the fact that um, the service has been updated. I don't know if you see that, um, if you're able to see my postman screen. Yes, we see that now. Okay. Um, so that's basically it. I think um, I will now go back to the presentation. Um, maybe I still have a few minutes. Um, let me see. Yeah. Do you see my presentation again? Yeah, yes, so um, I also wrote down some further optimizations that I could use myself um, because not everything is perfect, of course. Um, especially there is quite some vendor lock-in as you probably noticed. I'm using um, most of my services from AWS. I build in some abstraction layers, but I do not have currently other implementations to work with uh, Google Cloud or Azure, um, but I know they provide pretty much the same services. So should be able to, um, to work um, in, in kind of the same way. Also, there is uh, still something to, uh, that get, could be optimized in terms of the caching of dependencies uh, with my Maven uh, build process. Um, so if I optimize that, then it will build um, even faster. It will use dependencies that are not changed from the previous uh, build cycle. Um, and then also something that I don't use at this moment is infrastructure as code, like Terraform and Ansible. Um, you don't, you didn't see it in this presentation, but before upfront, I needed to uh, define all the environment variables. And I also had to do that twice in GitLab and in uh, AWS itself, um, which is also pretty error prone if you want, oh, you have to copy paste it every time. Um, and I could, I could look into uh, a bit more automation in that regard. To, uh, to make it less error prone. And perhaps you also have some suggestions um, how to make it all um, even better, but that's, um, yeah, I'm happy to hear in the, in the Q&A section. For now, this is um, the presentation and thanks for listening. Okay, so thank you, uh, Peter, for the, for the nice explanation. Uh, so now I open the floor for your Q&A. So uh, we're not that a big bunch, so I would just suggest if you want to speak out, just open your mic and uh, go ahead. No questions for Peter? Yes, this is Wouter speaking. Um, uh, my, my main concern here is indeed the vendor lock-in. Is there any perspective uh, on that, on, on a kind of unification between those platforms? Um, the context is that we're in... Uh, uh, in the product development for uh, for many different customers and they will all have their own preferences in terms mm -hmm. of the platform they choose. Yeah. So, um, like I said, I have some abstraction layers which I could use. That would be maybe my first step in order to make it less uh, vendor locked in with AWS. Um, but I also think, I'm not entirely sure because I never worked with, um, with these infrastructure as code uh, solutions like Ansible and, and Terraform but I think they could be working um, cloud provider agnostic. So if you're there, you can basically define your complete um, architecture in a, in a script file or in um, a declarative language. And you can use that to, to set it all up. Um, I know that's the theory about it. Um, I don't know if probably there's still things to look out for in practice, but um, it should make it less vendor locked in. But I, maybe someone else knows more about uh, these platforms. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for uh, Peter? What things you would like to add? Perhaps somebody has some uh, additions. Well, maybe I can also add something because I didn't show it in the presentation itself, but. Um, you also saw that I made the staging environment. Um, it was a bit out of scope of this presentation, but in the end, you want to um, uh, go from the one environment to the other one. So that's um, what I didn't show, but um, if, you, if you then merge the development branch to the staging branch, I, I think you know, most of you know that, but it should be all also going pretty flawlessly. 
um, to bring the new application life in another environment while you still keep them completely separate in, in uh, separate VPCs. Okay, thank you, Peter. Yeah, if there are no more questions, we can uh, we can round off. Uh, I think um, no more questions. Okay, then I will will continue. So, as Peter mentioned, he has a manual made and has some documentation on this. So uh, we will send the feedback survey out on Monday, and we'll add the documentation provided by Peter and the manual to use um, for all of this. Uh, furthermore, we, we recorded this session as well, and uh, it will probably be available pretty soon via our website. So if you missed something or you want to share it with some colleagues, please go ahead and uh, yeah, you can, uh, can have a look at it again. So I'd like to thank you um, for all your attention and your presence. And then uh, we'll uh, hope to see you in one of our next webinars. So keep, uh, uh, keep up to date via our website and you can join some more webinars uh, on data and on front-end development in the coming weeks. So thank you. All right, thank you also, Christoph. And thanks everyone again for uh, listening. Thank you for your presentation. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so bye guys.